So, okay, yeah, so the title of my talk is Watching Brain Circuits in Action. So I'm actually um, the, the director of the Centre for Neurotechnology at Imperial College London. Um, and this is a centre um, uh, really of, um, of people working at the interface between neuroscience and engineering. We run a doctoral <coughs> training centre, the recent uh, 10 million pound um, uh, uh, initiative for a doctoral training centre in, in neurotechnology. Um, we our first uh, our cohort of students have just come up to the end of their first year now. Um, now, in giving this talk, I guess there are two talks I could have given. One of them was really about what everybody in the centre is doing. Um, you know, what's the state of the art in neurotechnology? But in 15 minutes, perhaps that's. Um, I thought I couldn't really do that justice. Instead, what I've decided to do is actually tell you a little bit in more depth about some of the things that I've been doing in my own research lab. Um, it's perhaps less immediately applicable to um, humans, et cetera, than, uh, than some of the things we might have been uh, seeing, um, although there might be some, there are certainly some uh, sort of benefits uh, from it. Um, so um, let's start off um, thinking about really the thing that I'm interested in here, which is reverse engineering brain circuitry. Um, and just to sort of illustrate that brain circuitry for you, I've shown you um, um, some of these, these are brain bow, you might have seen this, it's uh, actually from a mouse um, which has uh, basically had fluorescent proteins of, sort of different colours uh, randomly expressed in it. So you can see the sort of the exquisite structure of the circuitry there. The point here is that it's quite complex. That's the neocortex, um, there's another area called the cerebellum, um, which is you know, right out the back here, responsible for a lot of uh, our sort of sensorimotor control, their ability to you know, play rugby, for instance. Um, so these are the circuits that I want to reverse engineer. But let's play a little role-playing game. Let's imagine that um, actually I was an engineer um, working for, um, for instance, um, a company, say Samsung. Um, this is the, the Apple A5 uh, chip that you, you find in some of the iPhones. And let's say I was working for Samsung, I'd been put on my desk, um, reverse engineer the functionality of this chip. But let's say, unfortunately, my background was in neuroscience. Let's say it was sort of classical neuroscience. I was trained back in the 50s or 60s. Um, what might I do? Well, what I'd do is I'd actually draw lines across that chip and I'd measure the voltage at random points along those lines and I'd try and infer how that chip worked, okay? Um, so the classical neuroscientists used these sort of microelectrodes, sort of tungsten in glass microelectrodes, poked them into the brain, you know, stopped whenever they saw a signal. Um, they could, you know, big enough amplitude, and they'd be recording things one, one at a time and trying to work out how it worked. Clearly, that's not going to get you far. Um, a more modern neuroscientist might um, use one of these microelectrode arrays, um, place it over the chip, and record simultaneously the voltages at a grid of these points. Um, so the comparison here is with this Utah array. It's what you might have seen some of these sort of videos of people with brain machine interfaces sort of controlling a robot arm, etc. That's the electrode array they've got implanted. But note, it's very, the spacing is very large here with respect to the underlying circuit elements, the transistors. So again, it's going to be a pretty tough job to try and reverse engineer the functionality of this chip. So what other approaches might we take? This is uh, slightly tongue-in-cheek partly with reference to the last talk. I didn't know you were, you were speaking. What you might do is you might basically put your chip in one room, put a thick concrete wall, equivalent of the skull, in between it and try and listen to it on the radio. Um, now, that might be great for picking up signals from it, but you're not going to be able to tell how it works uh, from that. Um, OK, so we need new approaches. Um, just to sort of illustrate the problem here, this is the Utah array um, with, and I've put these little yellow dots there, um, those are sort of the locations of, say, two of those probes, the nearest adjacent probes. Um, so you can see that they might, you might pick up one or two neurons on each of these electrodes. Um, and that means you'd be sampling, I did a little back of the envelope calculation, about one in 8,000 brain cells, okay? Um, you know, just from that area that you can actually access with it. So that's, you know, we'd call that undersampling. So what other ways might you ap approach this problem? Really, there are two games in town. One is to put microelectrodes in the brain, microelectrode arrays in the brain, but make the electrode arrays really spaced, uh, closely spaced, sort of dense electrode arrays, what we uh, call polytrodes in the business. And you know, this approach, we, we've done this. My group have done this as well. Um, and I think we can make some progress that way. The limiting factor is each time you put one of these electrodes in the brain, it causes damage. So within about 20 or 30 microns of the electrode, you basically kill, kill cells. 
um, and you get sort of build up of um, sort of scar tissue and effect around these electrodes. You want to put too many of them in, then you know, you're actually disrupting the thing you're trying to measure. Um, and of course, in the context of the brain, that's not very good. Um, so the other way, which I'm going to be talking about today, is to use optical imaging approaches. Um, this uses something called a two-photon microscope. Okay. Now, um, I won't really go through the details of the physics of it, but basically, we're imaging something that's fluorescent. Okay. Um, we, we use some kind of light source, typically a laser. Um, so use a reasonably high energy uh, laser um, with very short pulses. So basically there's a lot of power, but for a very short period of time, we, we sort of send that energy in. Let's say that we're looking at a fluorescent substance. Um, an electron goes up in energy level, sort of comes back down, gives off a photon. We see that photon. That's what we see in the microscope. Okay. Now, we use a wavelength such that a pair of photons get absorbed by that fluorescent material. Okay. Um, now, that means a few things. One of the things it means is that actually what's called the point spread function, sort of where you know where the light came from, is very small, of the order of a sort of a micron so um, in diameter. Um, and that means we know exactly where that light came from. It, it might have come from within a particular cell or even at subcellular resolution. So that's great. The other thing is that means we can use long wavelength light, which is scattered less by tissue. It means it penetrates more deeply through tissue, which is good. So this is sort of therefore a, an approach which is suitable for imaging. Now I've sort of I've drawn a little, um, this is a rat brain here, okay? Um, so it's actually a, a piece of a rat brain there. And um, that's what we're going to be talking about here. We can use it to image the brains of small animals, okay? Um, uh, mice and rats. In principle, it's applicable to humans, but, um, you know, that's the long-term future uh, at this stage. So, so this is our device. We can use it to sort of uh, to image um, things in the brain. Um, here's a few examples of the things we've done with that. Um, here's a case where we've injected um, dye into the bloodstream, and we can image um, the cerebral vasculature. Um, this is just sort of image looking down through through the the blood vessels in the brain. So we can we can do that, and we can then use that to sort of monitor sort of things like sort of stroke conditions, etc. Um, we can also use it to image um, neurons. Um, here's some example here of actually a couple of cases, a few cases we've used to image um, uh, neurons from the cortex. Um, so uh, these are actually in the visual cortex. Um, these are about, so this depth, total depth down here is 800 microns or, or just under a millimeter. Uh, which in the mouse brain is basically sort of nearly through the thickness of the cortex of the mouse brain, okay? Um, and um, you see sort of these features of the neurons, the cell body down here, what we call a dendritic tree, so the tree-like structure, and then this is the surface of the brain up here. Um, and so these are sort of four different examples. These are actually taken in vivo. They're taken in a, a live uh, anesthetized uh, animal. So we can use it, uh, for instance, um, uh, one example is um, mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. We can use it to sort of monitor how changes in um, uh, the structure and the function of brain cells occurring with treatments for Alzheimer's. Um, okay, now one little cheat that I've sort of done here. These are actually sort of reconstructed after the fact. It takes maybe a few minutes to sort of image. We take an image, we move down, we take another image um, to reconstruct a three-dimensional volume. And then I'm sort of rotating that around. Um, so just looking, this is what we're looking at here. I'm starting the surface. We're moving our microscope down, 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 and you're seeing what happens as we move sort of deeper and deeper into the brain. You can see these sort of objects here, the neurons, brain cells. As we go deeper and deeper, it gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer because um, it's harder to see that far through the brain. See these dark objects that are blood vessels. There's a sort of negative image of the blood vessel, a shadow because of the blood vessel. Okay. Um, so that's an image of the cerebral cortex. I mentioned the cerebellum as well. Um, here's a similar example from the cerebellum. Um, I'll sort of take you through it. It's got these interesting stripy structure. That's because of, of, of the way the brain cells are. There's this, this little sort of grid um, which is performing sensorimotor, sort of sensory motor uh, calculations here. Um, and we'll sort of start over from the start now. So we're going deeper. We see this sort of grid coming down. 
we'll see, see some blood vessel there. We'll see the cell body starting to come up. And in green this is, and then in red, um, what I've done is I've filled a pipette with a red dye. So we've been able to place a pipette into the brain, sort of take it down and record activity um, from, a, from a brain cell under visual guidance. So the history of neuroscience has been basically recording activity blind. Okay? Now we can record it from things that we can actually see. Now, the other thing we can do, it turns out that if we use a particular dye, this one here, um, then the fluorescence that we see, the intensity of the light we see, depends upon the calcium concentration in the cells. Okay? Um, now, every time a neuron finds an action potential, which is what it uses to communicate with other neurons, there's a calcium influx into the cell. So we can use that to monitor um, the activity of brain cells, to watch them talking to each other. Um, now, this is a raw image from that kind of uh, uh, um, situation. It's always a bit of a risk showing a raw image like this, a raw movie. I've, I've spent many hours in sort of dark laboratories looking at this stuff. Um, so it makes sense to me. Um, so if you kind of just sort of glaze your eyes a little bit, you should be able to see some sort of flashes, basically, sort of white flashes, sort of occurring in little sort of stripes down here. Sometimes they sort of go isolated. Sometimes you get whole areas sort of going off together. Um, so this is, this is the sort of the raw, the raw data, what we actually sort of see in the lab there. And then we can analyze that. Um, we can sort of do a bit of analysis. Um, here's, here's an example here. This is, this is basically the reconstructing the structure afterwards, like I did back at the start, you know, through the depth of the, of the circuit there. Um, we might take one plane there, look at a movie at that plane. We might take a region there. Um, and pull out the signals, average them together at each time instant so that we've got, and then I'm drawing that along here, this trace here, so you see these little fluctuations, these spikes. That's the fluorescent change is caused by action potentials. At the same time, I'm monitoring with my electrode what the actual electrical signal is on the bottom there, and you'll see they sort of they line up. But of course, we can record electrically from just one of these cells, and we can monitor a whole region um, together. So we can watch um, these cells um, sort of flashing away. And then we can analyze the data. We can basically sort of try and interpret what, you know, what they're actually saying to each other. Um, now, that's sort of two-dimensional imaging. We're going to a position in the brain. We're taking a movie. Um, we're sort of watching what's going on. But of course, brain circuitry is three-dimensional. So can we use our microscope to do three-dimensional imaging? Well, it turns out we can um, with a few tricks. So here's an example here. Um, ignore that stuff up there. That's kind of an artifact. You should be looking at this little disk that's going up and down there. Okay? What we're doing here is we're putting an something called an electrically tunable lens um, into the light path of our microscope. What it is, it's basically a spherical membrane. You pass current through it, and it changes the curvature. And that means it will shift the light up or down. So we can actually do that very, very fast, so we can move our focus of our microscope up and down very, you know, quite fast. Here we're actually moving it over a whole three millimeters. In practice, we probably do it over, you know, a shorter distance there. So we can basically, in this case, with this approach, we can at about seven volumes per second, seven hertz, um, we, can, we can image um, circuitry. Um, this is sort of in the test bed in a sense. This is just, you know, a, a vial of fluorescein rather than a real brain. Um, we can take that a bit further. If we want to do that faster, we might take a slow image, we might see where the cells of interest are, and then just directly move that little point um, that we're imaging the light from around, from place to place. Um, and this is what we've done here. This is our, our little microscope set up. Okay, that's, you can see the microscope there. It's actually a high-speed camera optics looking at it from the side here, which we're using to do this. And we found out where a set of, a set of cells are, and we've basically, you've seen that, um, seen this video here. We're moving this around. Um, quite rapidly in um, sort of three-dimensional space, which we can do at you know, sort of up to hundreds of uh, times per second. So hopefully that will have given you a bit of a flavor of the technology for, uh, or advances in the technology for looking at, uh, looking at brain cells, um, looking at sort of brain circuitry in action. Um, so basically using two photomicroscopy and you know, expensive lasers are about 100,000 pounds, unfortunately. Um, we can image activity in, in, in small brains. Focus at the moment is on animal work. In principle, it's possible to do this in a human, but um, you know, there's a lot of safety hurdles uh, sort of still to overcome before it will become a, you know, an approach for you know, looking in fine resolution during neurosurgery, for instance. 
Um, so the applications at the moment are really sort of studying mouse models of neurological disorders like Alzheimer's disease, you know, characterizing how drug and device treatments for uh, these brain disorders affect the actual brain circuitry, and of course in the process sort of advancing our understanding of how these circuits actually work. Um, so thanks for your attention. <laughs>